Welcome to City Cinema Tech, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, we have the rare pleasure of presenting a Soviet film from the 1930s, Happiness, directed by Alexander Medvedkin. Now, when we think of Soviet films from the 1920s or the early 30s, we think of a number of things, Soviet montage, fast cutting, technical innovation, patriotism from one point of view, propaganda from another point of view. But one of the things we perhaps do not think about is fantasy and whimsy in the service of comedy and satire. And that's exactly what we're going to see in Happiness, one of the most unusual films ever to be made in the Soviet Union, one that caused controversy at the time of its making and was suppressed, and that has been rediscovered by a whole generation of film viewers and film scholars. Now, take this opportunity and tune in later to watch our discussion of happiness, uh, where, in which we'll be have with us, uh, as usual, a guest, Professor Louis Menashe of Polytechnic University. But enjoy this opportunity to see a really rare, whimsical, funny, satirical comedy, Happiness. Welcome back to City Cinema Tech. I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity uh, to see what's rather an unusual film. Uh, there are many features that make it unusual, ranging from its uh, style through uh, who, the person who made it, the conditions of production and reception. There's a lot to talk about in the next 30 minutes, and it's a pleasure to uh, welcome back to City Cinema Tech to talk about these things, uh, Professor Louis Menashe. Uh, Louis is a professor of history at Polytechnic University uh, in Brooklyn, and he's someone, I suspect a number of our readers, or our, our spectators, I can get it right, Louis, uh, our spectators have read uh, in um, Cineast, where he is one of the editorial associates of this Journal of Film and Politics, uh, Cineast. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry, and I appreciate being here. Uh, and I congratulate you once, you, once again on uh, an interesting choice for your viewers. Well, let, let's, <laughs> let, let's, let's talk about that because, you know, this is a series that we've been doing uh, in which we had, this, in this series, there's been one sort of obvious exclusion. Uh, that is, we have not shown an Eisenstein in this particular series. Good for you. Uh, <laughs> because we've, we've shown Eisenstein before, and Eisenstein oh, is shown, and there. we are uh, taping this interview during the centennial of Eisenstein, which is something important for us. But uh, one of the things we wanted to do uh, here on City Cinema Tech was to highlight certain of the other well-known giants, uh, Pudovtin, Dov Dov Dovshenko, Dovshenko. Kuleshov, um, very tough. Very tough. But here we are, and we have this strange case of Med Medvedkin. Let's just start with some of the stuff of Louis. Who's Medvedkin? Yeah, it's, who is this guy? <laughs> who is this guy? Who is this, who is this guy? guy anyway, is exactly the question. You know, uh, Jay Leda's uh, famous uh, authoritative and essential book on Soviet cinema has a split screen cover in right. the paperback edition. And uh, one side shows, I think, uh, the intense gaze of the, women, of the woman on the uh, steps in Odessa from, the, from Potemkin, a very famous shot. Right. And then there's a, the other uh, half shows these peculiar sort of porcine masks with mustachios, uh, with open mouths. Uh, and rifles, peculiar soldiers, stylized soldiers. And I always wondered, where the heck is this from? <laughs> you know, so you do a little digging in the Eisenstein, right. in, the, um, in the book itself, and you discover that it is a still from a film called Happiness, right. sometimes called Snatchers. I think, actually, Jay later refers, to, refers it to it under as that title. Snatchers, right. Uh, and I always wondered about this film. You know, I never saw it. You know, it's not part of the Pantheon. It's not part of the Corpus. Right. You know, it's not part of the Eisenstein, as you point out, Eisenstein, Vertov, Pudovkin, Dovzhenko, Canon. Right. right? Uh, and then, of course, I saw this film by Chris Marker, an idiosyncratic filmmaker, documentary filmmaker himself. Right. Uh, Who's uh, French. Who is French about an idiosyncratic <laughs> filmmaker <laughs> in the former Soviet Union. And this is the guy. This is the guy. This is Medvedkin. 
And the film is a kind of interesting. It's a two-hour documentary, which uh, essentially, from a, a left-wing perspective, he calls right. it the last Bolshevik. He right. calls Medvedkin the last Bolshevik because, after all, he was a committed filmmaker, and he wanted to unite uh, uh, politics and art and, and use film uh, for the purpose of reaching the masses in the classical um, uh, mode. Um, although his his mode was not socialist realism, it was right, something well, very, we'll, very we'll talk about it. <laughs> as, as far as this film is concerned, at any uh, rate, and the, the Chris Marka film is a um, kind of political biography, and it's also a uh, historiographical portrait of of the Soviet Union, from its inception right down through uh, the period when the fi film was made, which I think is in the mid '80s. Um, Medvedkin himself was born in 1900. He died in 1989. Right. So he spans the period of Soviet history itself, and uh, a couple of years later, Soviet history comes to a stop. Um, he's a uh, he's a communist. He fights in the Civil War. Uh, he's a communist when he's uh, at the age of uh, 20. He joins the party. Um, he's attached to a film unit responsible for military uh, affairs. Uh, he makes a series of short satirical films. I don't think these things exist anymore. I mean, you look at, at, at Soviet reference works. Right. First of all, many Soviet reference works don't even mention Medvedkin, but those that do indicate that his works just simply have disappeared. Um, and he uh, makes a series of short satirical films in the 1920s. Um, and some people in government, in the, in the Soviet state and party, see his uh, worth, and that accounts for his being appointed the head of a kinopoist, which is a fascinating uh, Okay, experiment. what's a kinopoist? It's a film train. Uh, in 19, from 1932 to 1934, we have essentially a studio on wheels, uh, four or five cars, um, living quarters, a lab, a screening room, uh, a printing press, and they travel throughout the Soviet Union in this period of the first five-year plan right. to critical industrial uh, and agricultural points, and they film on the spot. They film on the spot. They'll uh, show, for example, the opening of the Great Dnieper Dam in right. 1932. Uh, and that evening, they will show the film to the workers on that right. dam. Uh, well, they'll News at nine, you could say. <laughs> you might indeed. <laughs> uh, and um, they'll go to um, an industrial site and they'll speak to workers about uh, what the problems are and they'll film them. Uh, they'll show the film and then a discussion will ensue. So it seemed to be, you know, the sort of perfect wedding of art and politics and mass uh, enlightenment. Uh, and he was, he seemed to be the perfect man for the job. And he did this from, I think, 32 th to 34. Um, then he goes on to um, make this first f uh, feature film, right. Happiness, Happiness, which dies. No one knows about it, east or west. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. You know, it's uh, one of those, uh, those things. I, I, one of the things I'd like to suggest about this is we really still don't know film history. I mean, there's a way in which we know a chunk of what is important. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's, there, there, we're not going to discover a mm -hmm. film that completely, you know, knocks Battleship Potemkin or, <laughs> uh, you know, Citizen Kane off of it. Well, that, they right. were unimportant, right. and we right. just discovered something that was, that, that was more important. But the degree to which... It's, it's a part of the whole world, uh, yeah. It's a part of the whole world, thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, and the, the, that, that films like this, that, that films of this quality and interest we, we just have to be honest, have already been lost that we're simply yep. never going to know about, yeah. but that there, there are things lying in archives, yeah. and, and thank goodness for film historians, huh, Louis? Oh, absolutely. Uh, or what a swell or, bunch of guys we or are, left, huh? Or leftist politicos, you know. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Who uh, will dig and, and to find yeah. this. He, this he was essential, as I understand it, you know, it, it requires further research. Um, it's, it's interesting commentary on our own times. Uh, He's discovered, I think, by the French left in the 60s and 70s. The Soviets themselves discover him, or right. film, film students kind of discover him right. uh, in that same period. Uh, but the French left discovers him, and you know they're looking for alternative forms of film presentation. 
And here is this, this figure with the, the film train. What a wonderful idea, you know, to film on wheels and Absolutely. to interact with, you know, the masses. Uh, and um, I think even clubs were formed called Medvin Kino, Medviet Kino okay. clubs, meaning, you know, kind of play on, on, word, on uh, his name attaching the, the term Kino or right. Russian for film. Um, and you know, it's 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 uh, it's thanks to them, I think, that we know. Maybe even you learned about Midvietkin through these alternative oh, sources. No, I, I learned for, I learned about him from the, in exactly the same way uh, 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 you did. That is, I, I saw I, I had read uh, the li uh, Jay Lida's book. He was the late Jay Lida at that uh, at that point, and a, a key work mm -hmm. in which uh, one can read through. And here was Lida, mm -hmm. who was a student of Eisenstein, who was in the Soviet Union uh, in the 30s, and who had an opportunity. He saw all the films that became famous. He knew all of those people. He saw all the other things. And then he saw all the things, or he would admit the things he saw there that were not exported. And who knows, some of them were destroyed by the war. Right. Others were, 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 were tucked away. But you're reading Simply about discarded. a whole list of things in which you say, I've, how would I ever see that? Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Uh, I in, and I must say that that for example, we have programmed not in this series, but uh, we've we've shown several times on City Cinematheque. We've showed Friedrich uh, Ermler's Fragment of an Empire, mm -hmm. a key film that mm -hmm. again only became available because someone like Lida had preserved in a book for English reading public, and that book has been published in another European languages as well, this record in which people would, can actually even look for things. Yeah. The other thing, of course, is that uh, certain things that we admire, adore in the West were flops over there. Oh, you, yes. know that, you know, Potemkin was a big flop when it yeah. was shown. They would, the Russian public would much rather see Mary Pickford yeah, yeah, yeah. and Douglas <laughs> Fairbanks and, uh, and so on. Um, actually, Medvietkin's happiness falls into the same category. It was an, it was neglected, discarded, and uh, and virtually lost until you know it's rediscovered much much later. Well, th there is a, there is one parallel between uh, there's probably several more, but one important parallel between the case of Medvietkin and Vertov, and that is that uh, in both cases their works themselves become uh, reevaluated. That is, they are. Uh, if, if Eisenstein is the centerpiece, as well he should be, I'm not saying that, but they are eccentric from there in terms of this period of enormous innovation in, in Soviet cinema, a period that then passes and in fact is suppressed in, in a set of ways. So yes, they are stylistically innovative, and we'll talk about mm -hmm. that and happiness mm -hmm. in a minute. Mm -hmm. But there's another aspect of their filmmaking that is rediscovered and becomes very important, and that's something you've already touched on, and that's their mode of production. That is the way they went about uh, making films themselves. Vertov yeah. becomes uh, imitated, again, particularly in France, uh, Godard uh, is highly influenced by, by, by Vertov. And then Cinema Verite is an exact translation of Kino Pravda, Cinema Truth, right? Uh, no, uh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely yeah. the case. And they call, and when Godard leaves making feature film for a period of time, he forms the Zizia Vertov group. Right, right. Um, but Medvedkin is the same, can same, s serve the same purpose that is quite a, the same cult hasn't been established no, about yet can to be sure I mean to be sure body of work uh, well maybe you know we don't know I mean well, it, but the it, body but of work has disappeared I think you know I mean but next trip model, to Moscow maybe I'll look for it you know, uh, be interesting uh, research project and, and you can come back and tell us about it Absolutely, we promise I'd love to I'd love to uh, but 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 at least the model is there of this notion of direct engagement given by this train and the way in which it's not subordinate to some kind of centralized studio structure, which right. w which certainly was you know uh, the case when Medvedkin was doing it for two years there, but then becomes for Western filmmakers becomes a kind of model yeah. for independence from studio systems, right. whether it be Hollywood or French it's style studio correct. systems. That yeah. you can go and do this and be, and of course it's an engaged cinema as you've uh, as you've outlined. Absolutely. That is that is taking on particular issues and serving people in a particular oh, yeah. kind of it's, way. It's an alternative form. 
Um, he goes on after, after the 30s, he, um, he's active in the war, in the Great Patriotic War, right. as they called it uh, over there. Uh, he organizes film screenings at the front, and then he's uh, associated with a very fascinating project late in the war. I think or the Red Army has already reached uh, Prussia, okay. uh, and uh, they develop this uh, magnificent apparatus, which is, I think, a 16 millimeter camera. I'm not sure. I think a 16 millimeter camera attached to a rifle stock, wow. which they distribute to you know to uh, uh, non-commissioned officers, for example, right. on the front, and they simply tell them, you know, just aim this thing. And shoot, and shoot, and uh, you know this was uh, another you know characteristic of the Medvedkian involvement, right. you know, in a, what we might call a very alternative uh, cinema. Right. And um, then after the war, uh, he continues to make films, documentaries on um, socio-political issues, uh, ecology, uh, imperialism. He's a Bolshevik, remember? Uh, yeah, right. Uh, imperialism, uh, the arms race, uh, the dangers of nuclear war. Uh, in the um, 60s and 70s, he makes a series of films on China. And again, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, my knowledge comes from just doing a little research on him. I haven't seen the films. Right. I would assume that they're anti-Maoist films. Right. Remember, this is the period oh, of yes, the Sino-Soviet and tension. uh, tensions and debates. Uh, one film that he does is called Our Friend Sun Yat-sen. You know, Mao, of course, is no longer our friend, but Sun Yat-sen might be. Um, and he continues to, to do these things, but he is essentially, you know, kind of forgotten. You know, the film world doesn't recognize him until there's a revival. Uh, I think Marker says uh, f uh, film students at Moss Film went down into the basement and discovered this extraordinary film, Happiness. This crazy film with uh, uh, nuns with see-through blouses yes. <laughs> and polka dot a polka dot horse uh, and soldiers with masks. And finally, in 1988, at Dom Kino, the, uh, the film center in Moscow, he is honored at long last. Uh, actually, I think in 1979, he had won a prize as an honored artist of the Soviet Union. So he's kind of recognized in retrospect. Uh, but the body of work is not there. I don't think it exists. Um, right. that's, this, there it, is this film, which shows what might have been, perhaps. And of course, that's not the direction in which Soviet film uh, went. Uh, the direction of Soviet film comedy was rather kitschy and corny. Uh, you know, the Alexandrov musicals, for example. Right. Are Volga, example, Volga. Let's just quote, quote Stalin's favorite film. That's yeah, right. right? Um, uh, life on the farm is presented in films, uh, you know, in, in, I mean, they're a virtual reality. They had nothing to do with reality, actually. The famous one is the Cossacks of the Kuban made by Piriev, uh just after the war. Um, but this is a very, very unique, uh, very unique venue. It's a very unique way of treating the whole subject of collectivization. Okay, let's talk about yeah. this whole subject of, of collectivization. Yeah. I think it's worth reviewing just for a minute or so how, how collectivization was a major issue for the Soviet Union, and then talking a little bit about what historically happened, and then about what happens in this sure. film, how it's treated sure. in this film. Sure. Well, it all has to do, I think you ha always have to come back to the figure of Stalin uh, here, because um, it's he who represents uh, the realization of the crash industrialization collectivization program uh, in the Soviet Union in the uh, late 20s and early 30s. Stalin is victorious in the intra-party struggles that take place after Lenin's death. and for a variety of reasons, in part panic, in part ideology. After all, here we are, uh, it's many years after the Bolshevik Revolution, and we don't have a socialist society yet. Yes, right. industry has been um, uh, socialized and nationalized, but there's this vast agricultural sector made up of individual peasant farmers who, after all, supported the, the Bolsheviks because they were given the land right. by the Bolsheviks, right? Um, and the, 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 it's, it's perceived by party figures that the peasants have a hold 
are holding the state and party and the Soviet Union itself in a kind of ransom. Uh, and so for reasons of panic and ideology, by panic I mean that there was a, a, a terrible harvest and, and um, the threat of famine in the late 20s, the decision is made to collectivize. And Stalin is the kind of figure who is willing to resort to great brutality to do this. Right. Uh, and this is the late 20s, early 30s, um, uh, the period of the first five-year plan, and they go together, uh, industrialization and collectivization. And uh, hundreds of thousands of peasant farmers are brought together by force. Of course, the official picture was that this was done voluntarily, but by force are brought together in so-called collective farms, which is a farm that we see in the second yes. part of the right. uh, film here, a kalhoz. Um, and uh, naturally, filmmakers and others had to represent this in the most positive way. Eisenstein did it uh, in the old and the new, and the, f the famous scene of the cream separator, uh, a mechanical device leaving peasant darkness and agricultural darkness of old Russia behind right. is symbolic of, of this. Dovzhenko does it in Earth and shows the conflict between those who resisted collectivization and the collectivizers. Um, Medvietkin shows essentially the same you know, terrain here, the field of collectivization, but in a, an extremely unusual uh, way, uh, in, in a way that recalls uh, old Russian folk tales. Uh, you notice that the film is called a skazka, which is a tale or a fable. Okay. Um, and it's essentially a fable about collectivization. And the central figure is uh, someone uh, that in, in folk uh, tales and oral traditions was known as Ivan Durak, Ivan, Ivan the Fool. Mm -hmm. And that's who this guy is. Uh, Translated here as the loser. The loser, which uh, yeah, is, is sort of okay. Khmer is the, uh, the Russian term. Um, and I think it's an underworld term, actually, which is also interesting yeah. about uh, Medvietkin's use of, of, of these terms. Um, Khmer is uh, an underworld term for someone who is a kind of, you, know, you don't entrust the more important jobs to this guy. So right. You don't entrust the important bank heists to this guy. You know, you may use him as a, as a spotter or a driver or something, but he's sure to screw up. Right. And that's, I think, the connotation. And that's what uh, is uh, conveyed here. Um, it's interesting. One, one film critic likes, likens his uh, work to the Lubok, which is the... Um, uh, uh, a woodcut print with text oh. that emerges right. in Russia in the 17th and 18th centuries and usually uh, tells of uh, stories with a moral, um, with uh, you know, bright uh, uh, colored patterns, um, distinct lines. And in the film you see that. There's a very sort of minimalist use right. of, uh, of space and architecture. And it is a kind of filmic lubok, a kind of uh, a filmic woodcut story. Well, that's very interesting because one of the things about those kinds of art forms, uh, and there's a, another American critic who's talked about the, the Soviet uh, cinema in this way, is in a certain sense the moral is already known because mm -hmm. you've already been told the moral and you know what the outcome is. So mm -hmm. our sense of a kind of originality uh, or suspense in storytelling is is is, is absent yeah. because it's a tra it's a body of stories that are already well known. So exactly. as one critic has put it, it, it is it is um, you know well known. I'll use the, the Russian uh, terms that the uh, well known fabula surprising sujet, which would be really well known story, mm -hmm. but very surprising presentation yeah. and style. Yeah, collective farm meets folk tale yeah. uh, in the figure of this, uh, of this guy. But what's also interesting is that it's not presented in a hackneyed way. I mean, there's this one, uh, there's a lot of pathos in the film. Yes. There's this one moment where he says, uh, I want to be free, uh, I, I want to be free, release me from the collective uh, farm. Um, and uh, he's, a, he's a kind of interesting figure and he says at another point, uh, I can't live in the old way and I haven't adjusted to the new. 
So it's not simply, uh, you know, sort of day-night uh, transformation. Comes to the collective farm, he sees its uh, virtues, and uh, yeah, 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 you know, rah, rah, rah. Um, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of subtle in that way, peculiarly well, enough. No, 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 and, and it uses its exaggeration admitting that there are exagger uh, 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 exaggerations. I'm thinking of the last scene, last scenes in the film in which he is inserted into the modern industrial urban right, culture, right, is right. literally made into a new man right. by the tailor, but right. has difficulty in getting rid of the old clothes and the old and the absolutely, old ways, and the degree true. to which that is symbolic is, is, is it's comically symbolic, because it's underlined as a form of of moralistic hyperbole. Mm -hmm. You I, know, I think that that's um, accurate. Yeah, uh, and, and so it says, okay, well, you, you know how we do this, but we're going to make it so much fun mm -hmm. for you to watch this that you're going to, you know, reassess it, or as the Russians. Uh, the, the, the theorist, the literary theorist that came out of this goes, we're going to defamiliarize something. It's right. a truth you know, right. but we're going, to, we're going to make you understand mm -hmm. that truth with a kind of new artistic um, uh, daring of the, a certain kind. The carnivalesque. Yeah, well, uh, filled, with, uh, filled with that kind of uh, rough, rough uh, humor. Um, uh, you know, not without charm, but, but absolutely. basically a, a pretty uh, a crude in spots, um, except for those moments that we cited, which I thought was astounding. I kept coming back to the uh, moment when the soldiers arrive. You know that great, great scene yeah. where uh, he's assaulted by bureaucrats, he's assaulted by the priests, he's assaulted by these strange nuns. Uh, and then suddenly these soldiers come marching on and uh, with their with their strange masks, and I think their lips are frozen in the shout, traditional shout of the military, say, when they charged in old Russia. We're going to have to freeze ourselves here. Ura! <laughs> great, great, great <laughs> in the because we're, we're at an end. If you'd like more information about City Cinematheque, drop us a line. Drop it to City Cinematheque, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. Let me give you that information again. Drop us a line to City Cinematheque, City University Television, 25 West 43rd Street, Suite 1220, New York, New York, 10036. Uh, Louis, they wouldn't, you know, <laughs> they wouldn't believe that I didn't plan that freeze that frame with wonderful. you. <laughs> freeze will, frame will with you. Will we get the Uda in? Yeah, the, <laughs> we will. We, we will. We must get the Uda in. Okay, we've got, we, we've got it. In, we've got it in. I hope that you join us again for uh, Ura uh, here <laughs> on City Cinematheque. Thanks for joining us today.